Hello, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Heath. I use they them pronouns. I'm the adult services librarian at Morrill Memorial Library. And the library is very pleased tonight to partner with Progress Norwood and Together Yes in kicking off our first of the fall 2022 sustainability series programs. Um, tonight's program is about climate conscious gardening. Um, I would just like to make a few logistical announcements before we get going. Um, please keep yourselves on mute throughout the, pre the uh, presentation. Um, our presenter will be taking questions at the end. So if you do have questions, feel free to pop them in the chat um, or jot them down and there will be a question and answer period at the end. Um, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our partner, Julie. Um, who is our Progress Norwood uh, representative tonight. Thank you so much, Keith, and thank you to the Moral Memorial Library for having us. Um, I have a couple of quick announcements about some upcoming programs. Um, first of all, this Saturday um, on the 24th from 10 till 2 is the stash share that Together Yes um, is organizing, um, which lets you swap free craft supplies. Um, that's in the Simone room of the library, and you can drop off materials starting Thursday evening um, until 10 a.m. Saturday, and then the swap starts at 10. Um, then on October 18th is the next sustainability series talk, and that is going to be hosted by Black Earth Compost. Um, we are still trying to figure out if that is going to be online or in person, so registration has not opened yet, but stay tuned and follow the library to see updates about that. And then Progress Norwood and the Trails Committee will be hosting our maybe fifth annual um, costumed hike. Um, this is at Endine slash Hawes, and um, it's a very fun, casual event. You can check out some of the Norwood trails and in costume. Um, so without further ado, um, thank you to Kristen Nicholson for coming today. She's with Blue Stem Natives, um, which is a native plant store in Norwell. Um, Progress Norwood had her, I think about a year and a half ago, um, on a kind of an introductory um, introduction to native plants. And today we're going to kind of go more in depth um, with drought resistant plants, um, which is really great after this crazy hot, dry summer. So um, Kristen, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, let's see if I do this right again. Hopefully everything looks good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so thanks everyone for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, I'm gonna just get my own face out of the way. So I'm not staring at myself. Uh, so let's see. There it is. Um, I'm going to start with a bit about us and how we got started. Um, Blue Stem Natives is a woman-owned native plant nursery located in Norwell, Mass. We strive to grow local ecotype plants from seed whenever possible, and we're committed to using environmentally and ecologically friendly farming practices. Our passion is making native plants more accessible to the everyday gardener, as well as increasing awareness and education around the benefits of using native plants in the landscape. I'm often asked what got me interested in native plants. Uh, four years ago, I had this light bulb moment. It's kind of cheesy to think about, but it's exactly what happened. I had been a dental assistant for 18 years, um, bored out of my mind and decided to go back to school. I randomly heard um, Doug Tallamy's Bringing Nature Home presentation one day, and that, you know, little light bulb went off. That is exactly what I had been looking for. Um, I consider myself, you know, an amateur environmentalist. And what he was talking about was exactly what I, the answers that I had been looking for. Um, I was a founding board member of Wild Ones, South Shore Mass. And I discovered this deep interest um, and realized that this was it for me. I'm definitely not an expert. I'm not at all, but I am very passionate about continuously learning and teaching others what I know. I'm not afraid to um, make any mistakes. I think that's where the deepest amount of learning happens. Um, but I really love to share everything that I learn with everybody I come across. So when I get started talking about native plants, I can talk for quite a while. 
Um, so what is the deal with climate change and drought tolerant gardening? Um, climate change is gonna be bringing about extreme weather um, in both directions. Just last year in 2021, we had record rain and it was cool um, and, and so much rain that it caused its own set of problems. Um, and then this year we went to record temperatures and drought and it was the fourth hottest summer on record. Um, and those types of swings are just going to continue and probably get even more extreme, which really stinks. So there are a few plants that are capable of handling extremes in both of those directions. And that's really what I mean by building climate conscious um, gardening or resilient gardens. Um, because if you only focus on plants that can handle extreme temperatures, like, like hot temperatures or heat rate waves or, or droughts, um, when we get those crazy summers, like we did last year, when we have it just inundated with rain and it's cool, um, you're gonna have issues on the other side as well. So what can we do to set up our garden spaces for success, no matter what comes our way? Luckily, there's quite a bit that we can manage to do. So our goals today are to learn how to put in the place of um, good bones for the garden. Everything starts with a good basis. Um, we're gonna cover all the contingencies we can think of. I'm sure mother nature can find some new ones to throw our way, but if we you know, try to think of all the worst case scenarios, we can try to um, prepare for them. And we're gonna learn to choose plants that will hopefully withstand extremes um, by choosing plants that have deep root systems, um, or special uh, attributes that help them tolerate uh, different weather conditions. So long before we even put plants into the ground, there are things that we can do to make sure our gardens can handle the extremes. So by taking the time to examine our properties and gain a real deep understanding of any problems, we can help mitigate the pressure of events outside of our control such as record rainfall, record high and low temperatures, extended droughts. Um, sometimes it's really hard to see the garden bones through the trees, uh, but it's precisely where we should start. If our garden starts off with issues, um, any extreme events are just gonna amplify those. So what do I mean by garden infrastructure? We always wanna start with soil. Quality topsoil is a gardener's best friend, whether you're planting perennials or have a vegetable garden. Um, it really should be your number one priority. And then hardscaping structures. What kind of structures uh, do you have in and around your garden? Um, sheds, paths, patios, do you have a raised deck, stone foundation, a long driveway? Do you have... Um, recreation courts like a basketball court or a tennis court. Um, these all have effects on soil temperature, quality, drainage, and potential pollution. So we really want to work to find and fix problems. Um, you can work on, uh, on things like drainage, um, install semi-permeable um, pathways and driveways. Um, to allow water to flow through them instead of puddling and flowing into the street. Um, you really want to look hard at the solar panels throughout your, the solar panels, solar patterns throughout your yard. Uh, ideally, you want to repeat this a few times throughout the year. I'm going to talk about that in more detail in a few slides from now. Um, you want to take into consideration existing trees and shrubs and um, how big they're going to continue to get because that's gonna change your garden in the future. And you wanna look for spots in your yard that typically have some issues throughout the year. So do you have an area that acts as a wind tunnel or uh, perhaps you're on a very sloped area like my yard slopes down pretty steeply. Um, perhaps you're on a main road and you experience degraded areas um, from salt and, and heat from that um, street. Um, do you have a low area where water tends to pool during heavy storms? All of these are problems that can be addressed and all of them are issues that can help uh, provide support for your plants. So this number one priority, we're gonna talk 
quite a bit about uh, healthy soil. Healthy soil allows more water to infiltrate and it retains more moisture. It really works like a, like a sponge. Um, and the purpose of building or, or how you build healthy soil, you can see by that picture, the um, hands on the right are holding extremely poor soil. And unfortunately, this is the soil that we get in the majority of our yards. Very, very, very few of us have native soil um, in our yards right now. Because um, when our homes were being built, most of the builders scraped off the top layer of soil, built our homes in the place, and then trucked in uh, new soil, and it's usually pretty crummy soil um, to fill in the areas. So it's really up to us to help build up that, in, uh, that top layer of soil. Um, we really want to add organic carbons to that in order to make that um, happen. So soil organic carbon has two really important functions <clears throat> to help it with drought, res drought resilience. Um, it can store up to 10 times its weight in water, which is incredible to think about. Um, usually you think about adding water to soil and you get mud, um, but really it acts like a, a good sponge. It's used as a source of food for soil microorganisms. Um, this includes bacteria, fungi, and other soil life. Um, do not shy away from the idea of having bacteria and fungi in your soil because soil is really a living being at its core. It has, creates habitat for um, macrofauna like earthworms, um, and that makes larger so soil pores for water to drain through so that it doesn't pond on the surface. Um, and um, it's also uh, important to um, keep what's already on your property and use that to help build up healthy soil. You don't have to you know, keep adding like fertilizers and um, other soil amendments. If you just look around and use what's already on your property and use good habits, you can help bring, um, build quality topsoil over time. There it goes. <laughs> uh, soil health is defined as the continued capacity of soil to function as a vital living ecosystem that sustains plants, animals, and humans. Uh, oftentimes in our like biology classes, we do talk about soil as a living organism. Um, I know it's hard for uh, the lay audience to think of it that way, but it really truly is. And so how does healthy soil help protect our gardens? It helps to regulate water. Healthy soil soaks up water like a sponge and it holds it in place, keeping it readily available for thirsty plant roots. It also prevents runoff and erosion when soil is poor. It becomes hydrophobic, which means it repels water. You may have seen this when you have a plant maybe in a pot and it's exceptionally dry, starts to pull away from the sides of the pot and you go to run it you know, fill it with water and the water just runs right off and down um, out the holes. So when soil is really, really dry, it actually works against itself and repels the water. Um, dry, dusty soil is easily washed away and that's destroying that valuable top layer that provides nutrients for so many plants. It also helps to sustain plant and animal life. It filters pollutants from entering our waterways. Uh, it works to cycle nutrients, so it's taking carbon, nitrogen, and phosphorus, which are all really vital nutrients uh, for plant growth. And healthy soil facilitates gas exchange from the air into the ground um, to make it uh, bioavailable for plants to use. Uh, healthy soil also provides physical stability and support, not only for plant roots, but for human structures as well. We don't want to be building structures on uh, poor crappy soil that doesn't hold together well. So according to the U.S. Department of Ag Agriculture, these are the main principles to manage soil for healthy um, or for health. <laughs> I read that sideways. Um, so we want to maximize presence of living roots, minimize disturbance, maximize soil cover, and maximize biodiversity. So by maximizing presence of living roots, we want to employ no-till procedures. 
Um, we've grown up thinking that we have to till the ground in order to um, be able to plant into it. And on, you know, and that was until recent and, and lots of people still believe that is true. Uh, we know to, that to be false now. It's actually far better to use um, sheet mulching or lasagna gardening to build on top of the soil um, and introduce more organic matter rather than tilling up the soil. Tilling disrupts the delicate ecosystem that lives underground and leads to even more compaction than was there before. So using living plants as mulch in place of wood, plastic, or stone helps to introduce more plant roots in the soil. It breaks up any clumps. Um, it reduces weed competition, helps keep the soil cooler. So maximizing soil cover doesn't necessarily mean loading a bunch of wood chip mulch right up to the stems of plants, but rather making sure the soil itself is shielded from the sun as much as possible. In fact, pushing mulch right up against plants can cause all kinds of problems such as rot and fungal and bacterial infections. Um, and it removes valuable habitat for uh, beneficial native insects, many of which actually will burrow into open soil um, and to build their nests. And maximizing biodiversity, not much more needs to be said um, about diversity and diversifying the species of plants uh, used in a garden. We want to use native plants whenever possible. And you want to instill habits that support a variety of wildlife in your yard. So talking about solar and wind issues, uh, sun exposure is one of the most important questions that you can answer about your garden. It's the very first question that we ask when somebody comes to the nursery and asks what kind of plants they should, they should get. Um, it's gonna help guide your choices in plant material. It's gonna determine if adding trees or shrubs can help mitigate any issues and it will help save you quite a bit of money and time, which we all love. So there are apps and appliances that can help you measure your sun exposure, but the very best option is free, your own eyes. Um, that's my favorite, I love free. So we'll go with that one. You wanna choose one spot in your garden uh, that you're gonna focus on because if we try to do everything, we get overwhelmed and then we quit. So pick one spot that you're gonna focus on and you're gonna observe the sun throughout the day over a solid month. Um, the, the whole season is better if you can have a little bit of patience, but I'm not patient, so we'll go with a month. Um, take pictures from like early morning, midday, into the evening, dusk time, um, and that can help you truly understand how much sun a particular area receives, um, including shadows. This process can also be captured using a camera set up to take photos throughout the day, and you want to aim to repeat this process throughout the growing season. Um, you can purchase devices designed to monitor sun exposure. They range from like $10 to hundreds of dollars. Um, there are also apps created to do the same thing. I haven't used them personally myself, so I can't tell you which ones are best and if they really work. Um, I did note see that Sunseeker is available for both Android and iPhone. Again, I have no um, knowledge of that app, but that, that's one that popped up when I was looking for one. You can use a website called suncalc.org um, to measure the sun's path across your property at various times of the year, um, which is helpful, especially when you're planning large projects like installing a veggie garden, a pond, or hardscaping. So you need to be able to see that path at various times of year. Um, so that website is very helpful. When it comes to wind, the easiest way to find issues is to walk your property during a windy day. Um, obviously only if it's safe to do so. Um, walk all around your house and see if there are spots when the wind is heaviest um, and also where it's blocked. That's important to know too. Uh, you can sometimes tell if wind is a constant issue by the manner in which uh, existing plants are already growing. So if they're bent one way, or perhaps have sparser leaves on one side, that's an indication that you have a persistent wind issue. So note down the area and the direction. 
this was a really awesome example um, I found online of someone charting the sun in their yard. It's exactly what I would recommend doing. And it looks like they get full sun in that back corner from noon to 9 p.m. So that's amazing. And I'm pretty jealous. Um, that's, I think that's where I would put my veggie garden, but um, it looks like they're putting it down in, in a different spot. They get, they, they have some nice sun options in there. So as part of our quest to improve soil quality, it's important to reduce inputs as much as possible. And by inputs, I mean the effort and materials you're putting into your yard. Uh, so this includes reducing or ideally eliminating herbicide and pesticide usage, uh, including what is sprayed on plants and in the trees. Uh, that's a really important aspect. So many pesticides intended to reduce one species such as mosquitoes, is sprayed in areas where we wouldn't think they'd really affect the soil. But when those leaves and plant matter fall and start to decay into the soil, those residuals become a part of it. And they work to destroy valuable microbes that contribute to soil health. Um, and that's to say nothing of the damage to our native pollinators. Uh, new plantings need water, no matter if they're native, uh, drought tolerant or not. So planting in the fall, like right now, <laughs> or the early spring, is really the best way to give new plantings a fighting chance. And we also want to reduce mowing and blowing on our property as much as possible. So one, it's going to save us a heck of a lot of work, and I'm all for that. But it also reduces pollution, reduces soil compaction, and it helps protect the vulnerable insect populations that use leaf and plant litter as habitat. Uh, of course, we wanna be water wise, include understanding that um, clean water in and of itself is no longer a guarantee in so many parts of the world and even this country. Um, we are so privileged in this area to have an abundance of clean drinking water but as these last few years can attest, that privilege is certainly not guaranteed. So by instilling water-wise habits, we can help conserve water while also safely ensuring that our gardens remain viable. Uh, installing rain barrels is a cheap and highly effective uh, method. And during times of extreme drought, like we had this summer, we can buckle down and use water in other ways from saving water uh, from our shower warm up, um, collecting water from our dehumidifiers and air conditioners to use in the gardens. Or if you really wanna dig in, installing gray water systems, which um, while legal in Massachusetts have certain rather complex code <laughs> requirements. So you definitely wanna call up your uh, local building inspector and inquire about code requirements. Um, it kind of gave me a headache when I looked into it myself. So that's a project for another year. I've said a few times that we need to be able to control the water that enters our soil and mulch is one way to do that. So what is mulch? Um, it's a permeable cover that helps retain moisture. It helps keep soil cool. And it also works to prevent weed seeds from getting enough sun to germinate. So ideally, we want to use living plants to serve as mulch. Um, by using ground covers and planting them really closely, living plants can do all of these things and so much more. Uh, remember how I mentioned one of the key aspects of healthy soil is extensive plant roots. So living mulch does just that. Um, when you can't or choose not to use green mulch, um, there are still better alternatives to the traditional wood chip mulch. Pine straw or salt marsh hay works incredibly well. Um, and it, it is found in local shops, especially small businesses, which is another plus. If you're having trouble locating it, call your local feed store. Uh, tell them what you're looking for. If they know people will buy it, they'll source it for you. Another great option is to use rich compost. Uh, many people make their own, but you can also buy it from reputable companies such as Black Earth Compost or Coast of Maine. And you're going to use the compost just like you would wood chips. Uh, 
uh, be sure to pull it away from the base of the plants, uh, just shown in that photo above with, with the little tree sapling there. You wanna create a well. Uh, you don't wanna have that mulch, no matter what it is, right up against the tree or the plant. So um, just some key terms here that I came across repeatedly when I was building this presentation. There is a difference between drought tolerant and drought resistant, and they're often used interchangeably, um, but they're really two different terms. So drought tolerant refers to plants that once they're well established, and that's key, um, they can handle a variety of conditions, also key. <laughs> Uh, they usually stay alive through mild to moderate drought. Uh, note, I said they stay alive. Um, oftentimes when we build these drought tolerant gardens, the goal is to keep the plants alive, not looking their very best. Um, so we do have to temper our expectations. Uh, they often have adaptations that give them a leg up when it comes to excessive heat and drought. They may have a thick waxy cuticle or leaves that fold up like this partridge pea, one of my favorites, this is an annual. Um, uh, and the leaves kind of fold up if it's too hot, too sunny, and it helps to conserve moisture for the plant. Uh, drought resistant often refers to plants that are built to handle long periods of time without any water. And these plants are typically found in desert locations. They include cacti and other succulents. Um, and their herbaceous plants are usually pretty sparse looking and they tend to be woody and straggly in appearance. So why does this matter? Right plant, right place. Um, we say that all the time. If you try to plant drought resistant plants in this area, many of them won't be able to handle our winters and they certainly won't survive a summer like we had last year. They're simply not built for it. Drought tolerant plants tend to be pretty hardy, but you still need to pay attention to which plants you use. So adding a non-native species just because it grows well here can um, lead to all manner of problems down the road. So how do we choose the right plants? Uh, we wanna use native plants well suited for your sun and soil needs. That's why we did all that time trying to figure out um, our sun and, and our existing soil. So you wanna take into account future growth too. That's really important and people forget about that all the time. Um, native plants are those which have grown in a region for thousands of years alongside the wildlife indigenous to an area. And they're especially capable of handling the temperatures, soil types, and typical weather in an area. So why do we talk about something called eco-regions instead of growing zones? One of the few things that defines native plants is where they grow. So pay attention to that phrase region or ecosystem. We've grown accustomed to the following growing zones, but when it comes to natives, it's more important to understand which ecoregion you reside in. For example, in New England, we have the following ecoregions, uh, Northeastern Highlands, Northeastern Coastal, Acadian Plains and Hills, uh, Atlantic Coastal Pine Barrens, and the Eastern Great Lakes Lowlands. That's a mouthful. Uh, if you really want to dig in deep, you can go all the way down to eco-regions of Massachusetts, which takes into account microclimates of different areas. So what's native to Natick isn't necessarily native to Nantucket. Why do we focus on eco-regions instead of the more familiar grow zones? Growing zones refer to the temperature changes in an area. So what can grow here rather than what should grow here. Zone six can encompass areas like parts of Massachusetts all the way across the Great Plains and up into Washington state. However, the plants that are native in Washington are not native in Massachusetts. They both support entirely different species of wildlife and planting outside of the ecoregion can have very serious repercussions on vulnerable wildlife populations. So how do you choose? There's so many plants to choose from. 
Um, there's many resources available to help you choose plants. Uh, whoop, whoop, bluestemnatives.com helps you sort plants by filter. You can see on the left, we have all the different filters you could choose by. And then Native Plant Trust has an amazing plant finder that allows you to filter by eco-regions and growing conditions. So now we're getting into the nitty gritty of actually how to plant a drought tolerant garden. Um, so how do you style drought tolerant plants? You want to aim to reduce expanses of lawn. Uh, everybody knows that lawn is a, you know, lawn turf grasses. It's a cool weather crop is what it is. And it requires a ton of work, a ton of water, um, a ton of um, amendments and inputs. So we're trying to reduce those things. So we want to reduce the expanses of lawn. Um, use living plants as mulch. We already talked about how to do that. Plant densely. Let plants touch each other. We don't need to separate plants by um, a foot of, of mulch. Um, plants like to touch each other. They like to hold each other up. It's, it's a very sweet um, thought too. So you wanna use other plants to help provide stability for taller species. A lot of people will complain like, oh, my uh, mountain mint, will ooh, they fall over. Plant more mountain mint or plant other grasses or something around it to help provide stability. Um, use grasses and sedges for visual interest, um, as well as providing ground cover during periods of the year when uh, perennials are otherwise dormant or still growing. So they're providing that visual interest. I love seeing grasses and sedges all year long, especially in the winter time um, when there's nothing else to look at. Uh, they help keep the ground cool and covered, uh, not to mention the valuable wildlife benefits they provide. You also want to plant species in groups or massing is the term in order to provide really the biggest punch. It looks better. It's more intentional. It provides better support for our pollinators and it allows you to group plants uh, with similar water needs. So it makes things far more efficient. Plants that have certain characteristics um, tend to be more drought tolerant, including those with silvery or gray leaves, um, those that fold up in times of stress like the partridge pea, or ones that have those deeper prairie mesh-like root systems. So if you do have some plant favorites that require more water, um, but you just can't bear to leave them out of your garden, that's okay. Um, my, some of my favorite plants are not natives and that's okay. Um, consider using large containers that you can focus water usage in, including some of the new smart pots or uh, self-watering system planters. Um, that can help you um, use water wisely in your garden. Uh, this is an important slide everybody wants to know. How do we care for plants during an extreme drought? Um, recall me saying that we have to shift our mindset to keeping plants alive and maybe not their best um, visual appearance. And that's just the nature of the beast. It, it, there's no real way we're going to keep this full lush garden during extreme droughts. It, it's just really unlikely. So once a plant is stressed, it's going to send all of its resources down into its root system um, in order to be able to survive another year and hopefully reproduce. So the flowers are gonna droop first, the leaves are gonna droop. Um, you might get some browning, crinkling of the leaves and they might fall off. Um, if you notice right now, we're getting a lot of plants that would typically look phenomenal um, in, in this cooler, rainy weather. And they just, they look like they're, they've had it, right? They've been through a lot. Um, and that's just how it's going to be. But if they make it through the winter, they're going to look great next spring. That's the goal. So how do we care for them? Uh, when we do have an extreme drought or a extended heat wave. Uh, you wanna water deeply and infrequently. That goes against our natural instincts. When it's hot and dry out, you think I gotta go water the plants. And we go out there and we 
you know, if we have a water ban, we're either, you know, not following it or um, we're hand watering with a watering can and that takes hours and who has hours? We don't. Um, so the goal is to water deeply and infrequently. So this includes what lawn you have. People who water their lawns, you know, every single day um, are doing a huge disservice because frequent watering encourages shallow root growth and it increases the chance that um, plants won't survive a prolonged heat wave. You wanna apply the water directly to the soil, not overhead watering. Um, sprinklers, bad. Drip irrigation, very good. Um, it's your best option. You can even set up a drip system from your water barrels uh, in using um, a timer, or you can even put in like a, a small, um, like aquarium pump to help move that water down uh, um, a hose. You don't want to fertilize before or during an expected heat wave. Fertilizing encourages plants to put more energy into growing larger leaves and flowers, and that can add to their stress during drought conditions. So if you don't use living mulch, uh, which you should, uh, add a light mulch, lightweight mulch is your next best option. Um, so like that rich loamy compost works really well as a, in a ring around the plants. So it's concentrating the water into the root systems where it can be um, most helpful. I call it um, using the drip line of a plant. Most of the time that's referring to a tree, but you can use that for herbaceous plants as well. Um, make a ring of compost around the plant kind of lining up where the leaves end. Um, and that really helps. So leaves are a perfect mulch, but it's probably the wrong time of year. So getting the salt marsh hay or the garden hay is an excellent choice that also works really well for pathways in a vegetable garden. Um, it helps to keep the ground cool. It'll help slow evaporation and it won't soak up water like dry wood chip mulch does. If you've ever, um, gone out to your garden after a good rain and like, oh, my plants are gonna be so happy and maybe scratched in the dirt under the wood chip mulch and that dirt is bone dry. You're like, we just got so much rain. The wood chip mulch acted like a sponge. Have you ever seen wood that's been sitting, you know, been dry and then it sits in water? All that water's in the mulch. So a lot of times when we get just, you know, a little bit of rain, it's just making your mulch wet. <laughs> And that's about it. Um, you can also add temporary shade in very sunny areas. Um, I recommended this a lot this summer. Something as simple as an overturned tomato cage wrapped in a little bit of burlap can provide enough shade to help plants get through the worst of it. Um, same thing if you were to create a little, uh, a little caterpillar tunnel or something. Um, it's not the prettiest thing in the world, but it'll help them survive, which is all we really want. So when it comes to helping wildlife during droughts, because really what they do is decimate our plants in search of water. Um, so protecting your plants from foraging is one thing, but animals still need sustenance. Um, so put out water dishes for wildlife, including um, shallow ones for insects. And you can add something called BT dunks um, to the water barrels. You can get them, they're also called mosquito dunks. You can get them at like any big box store or hardware store. And that helps prevent mosquito infestations by disrupting the life cycle of the adult mosquitoes. They're not gonna harm animals drinking from those sources. Um, so it's a good way to protect yourself and the animals. So this is the part everybody was here for. Um, what plants do I most recommend for drought tolerant gardens? Um, we would be here for hours if I talked about all my favorite plants. So I really had to narrow it down. Um, so these are some of my very, very favorites. Um, so for plants for full sun and dry to average soils, uh, I have the uh, Camicrista fasciculata, which is that partridge pea. Um, this is full, they can handle all the way up to um, from dry to moist soils, so it can handle just about all of it. It's an excellent annual to sprinkle throughout your garden for ground cover, and it helps rejuvenate the soil because it's 
a nitrogen fixer. It's pulling nitrogen from the air and through the magic of science, pulls that nitrogen into the ground and makes it bioavailable. So it's actually working to fix your soil. Um, Sertium discolor, which is field thistle. Um, again, full sun, dry soils, excellent pollinator value. Um, and birds love the seeds. So you can let this one go to seed, keep the seed heads on there and enjoy feeding the birds well into the winter. Aragrostis spectabilis, um, one of my very favorite grasses. This is purple love grass. Um, it's a perfect mounding grass to use as a ground cover. It's gorgeous color throughout the year. Um, it helps support so many butterflies. I think it's like 24 different butterflies. Um, and birds eat the seeds and it's gorgeous. So win. Of course, my favorite grass um, is Schizocarium scoparium, little blue stem. Uh, obviously, it's a big favorite of ours. You can use this throughout your garden to provide visual interest all year long. It does help shade uh, smaller plants, support for taller plants, and it has an extensive root system, so highly drought tolerant. Baptisia tinctoria is um, the small yellow wild indigo. It's very hardy, prefers dry soil, sandy, if you have your um, soil type there, and it has petite yellow flowers. Um, this one does, definitely doesn't like uh, competition, so kind of likes to be off on its own, um, but it's a lovely, it's a lovely plant. We love this one. And then one of my new favorites is Astrologus canadense, which is Canada milk vetch. It does prefer dry sandy soils. This one's awesome over a um, like a septic field. Um, it has these creamy yellow white flowers and it can handle deer pressure, which doesn't mean deer won't eat it, but that they actually will eat it and it kind of helps it grow back even lusher than it was before. And again, this is in the pea family, just like the Cami Cristo is. So it helps to fix nitrogen to improve the soil. I could go on for hours talking about different plants, um, but we actually put together a garden kit. Um, these conditions just so happen to match up with uh, our, our aptly named Hell Stripped Garden Kit. Um, and this contains a mixture of 12 plants, especially chosen for their ability to handle full sun, dry soils, um, even a bit of salt tolerance. Um, so that strip right near the street. So you can see uh, Penstemon digitalis is another great plant, uh, Penstemon hirsutus, uh, seaside goldenrod, what else is there? Black-eyed Susans, butterfly milkweed. So there's no shortage of plants that can tolerate these conditions. So for our people with shade, I know Norwood does have lovely trees. So we have plenty of shade to fill. Um, we have some great options. Um, you can plant a fern, even if we have uh, drought and heat waves coming on. So the Christmas fern is a lovely option that can handle dry shade, um, which happens to be probably one of the most challenging uh, niches to fill, but dry shade. And it does stay green pretty late into the winter season, which is always nice to have too. Um, Carex Pennsylvanica is like our go-to ground cover. I'll get into that in a moment. Uh, as well as wild strawberry. Um, we have a bunch of east, uh, asters that can handle dry shade as well. Um, the big leaf aster is an excellent um, option in place of hosta. I think it's a, it's a much prettier um, exchange for hosta, but that's just me. Solidago casea, which is um, the wreath goldenrod or otherwise known as blue stem goldenrod. Um, one of my favorites, it's very small and dainty and can handle the shade. And like I mentioned before, Penstemon hirsutus, which is the hairy beard's tongue, that stays a bit shorter. It's only about 18 inches tall or so, um, and can also handle full sun into shade conditions. So going over those ground covers, we have... Um, so many people coming to the nursery asking for ground covers or lawn replacements. Um, just about everybody does. 
So here's a few of our favorites. We have native violets, which I think are lovely, even though um, some people seem to um, despise them. I don't understand that, but I encourage the ones in my yard whenever I see them. Um, Antenaria species, which is the pussy toes. Those are excellent for lining pathways. Um, wild strawberry, again, that's my go-to uh, for lawn replacement. If you ask me, what can I put in place of turf grass? I will tell you wild strawberry every single time. Um, and um, I do have a picture of clover there. Clover is not a native plant. It's fine if you want to reseed your lawn with some clover, that's fine. But I would be careful to not exchange one, um, one species for another. Um, we don't want like one, you know, just having turf lawn and then exchange it for clover lawn and think that we're doing the right thing. It's slightly better than having just a turf lawn, um, but it's not the only answer. But mixed in with other plants, Great, do it up. And then of course, Carex pensylvanica. So in a part sun to, you know, part shade kind of dappled sun, uh, Carex pensylvanica or Pennsylvania sedge is perfection. I call it like the Muppet hair grass because when you let it grow and kind of flops over like that, I mean, if the wind hits it, it it's gorgeous, it's gorgeous. It can handle mild to moderate pressure uh, walking on it. Like you can walk on it, it's fine. Um, the dogs can't go tearing around it and the kids can't play soccer on it. Um, but that again is what turf grass is for. So it's okay to have a small section of turf grass to meet your lifestyle. Um, but in spots that you don't need to have turf grass, then plant something like this beautiful sedge. So that's about it for me tonight, folks. Um, we are at 376 Washington Street in Norwell. We're all the way in the back. If you come to visit us, we're gonna be open to the end of October. We still have a lot of really great plants available. So don't think that um, it's just slim pickings now because it's definitely not. And um, like I said before, fall is a really excellent time to plant. So uh, don't hesitate. You can put these plants in the ground right up until the ground is like too frozen to work in um, and they should be just fine. And that will allow them to settle in and uh, work really hard over the winter. Um, and then in the spring, they will um, just explode when that will be great. Um, and if you do get the opportunity, this little QR code here is um, just leads to a really quick little survey to let me know what you thought of tonight's presentation. And that's it for me. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Kristen. Uh, so I want to invite everybody at this point, uh, if you have any questions, feel free. You should be able to unmute yourself and you can ask your question directly. Or um, if you don't have a microphone or you don't feel comfortable speaking up, feel free to put any questions you have in the chat and I can read them out. So now's your chance if you have any questions. Um, I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, what is the best? So like I have an old home and I think a lot of the soil that surrounds my house has just been like compacted and not really well you know, maintained or whatever. What is the best thing for me to, to do to slowly over time um, amend the soil? Should I be like post, like pouring my compost tea over it? Should I be like slowly sprinkling, you know, better stuff on top or like yeah. when it's really so, compacted, especially, I feel like the, the rain just pours off of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all of those things you can do. Sheet mulching is really beneficial. So um, especially now is an excellent time. So if you're not familiar, sheet mulching is just taking layers of either newsprint or, or in cardboard. Um, you want to water the ground underneath, lay the newsprint or cardboard down, water that as well. And then you can cover it with layers of either leaves or uh, compost if you want. And then you just let it sit and it decomposes in place. And that's going to help um, 
slow the water down. So any water that hits that area is going to get sucked up by the, compo the, the compost and the um, cardboard on top. And it's just going to kind of slowly leach down into that. And then another part of that is actually putting plants in the ground, um, especially ones like I mentioned in the legume family that work actively work to rejuvenate the soil. So those plants, um, ones that will have tap roots are gonna help break that soil up. Um, anything that has those, those that you plant right into the compost, they're gonna go down and, and their roots are gonna work to break up that soil. Lots of native plants are actually really, really good uh, for actively regenerating poor soil. So um, don't hesitate to, to actually plant into those, but that sheet mulching is really key. Um, and use your leaves. Um, so instead of taking all your leaves off your property, doing all that work every fall, keep the leaves in the garden beds. As the leaves break down, they're actually creating valuable topsoil. Um, there's nothing quite like leaf mulch. Um, and leaf compost to uh, feed plants. So just by doing all of those things, rather than digging up that soil um, and breaking it up, then you'll help to uh, you'll help to build that topsoil up over time. Thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Sure. Um, can you recommend? plants that would break up the soil that are in the shade. So I know the indigos like sun. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the I, part think, the I think I would choose things like the penstemon. Um, penstemon would definitely help to work its way down into the soil and as well as um, Pacara. Pacara is another good one for shadier areas. Um, but again, a lot of our asters, some of our goldenrods, they all do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yep. Um, I see a question from Brenda in the chat. Do most of the native plants you recommend tonight come back year after year? A lot of them do. We have a, mostly um, a good number of perennials. There are a few annuals and um, biennials, um, like this, the field thistle is considered a biennial or short-lived perennials too. Um, but most of them produce ample amounts of seed as well. So they'll kind of reseed themselves in an area. That partridge pea that I love so much produces a lot of seeds. Um, and you can collect that seed and just sprinkle it throughout your garden in the spring. Um, and that will help um, just create these beautiful bursts of color. The bees absolutely love those flowers. Um, and it will actively work to uh, produce better topsoil for you. Would I ever consider doing a pop-up sale at the farmer's market? Um, we would, we will work on doing some sales a little close in different areas um, next year. So we have been, this is only our second year in business. So we're working on just trying to settle in a little bit before we expand our operations. Uh, but it, it's been in the works, um, in, in the talks. So we'll, we'll think about that over the winter. <laughs> What are your hours for Rockins? We are open uh, Tuesday through Friday from 10 to six and Saturday and Sunday from 10 to five. We're closed on Mondays and we'll be closing for the season on October 28th, unless mother nature dumps a foot of snow on us and then we'll be closing sooner. Uh, would you recommend spreading partridge tree seeds in the winter or the spring? You could do either. You could do um, in the winter, um, and the uh, stratification process will happen for you, or you could um, stratify the seeds yourself. And that just means working to break down that seed coat. Um, so you just put the seeds into a baggie with some sharp sand um, and add just a little bit of moisture to it, leave it in your fridge for a little bit. 
they only take like 10 days to, to stratify. So you could do either one. Awesome questions. We've got a couple minutes left. So last chance for questions, last call for questions. Could I have, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I have a lot of like polyester cover um, in my gardens that was left over from the previous owner. Um, and I was just wondering if you could give me like a recommendation on how to handle that. Should I just try to find all of it and tear it all up? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> that land, like weed barrier has to be the worst. It's the worst. Um, it doesn't stop weeds at all. Oh just <laughs> like weeds grow right through it or on top of it um, mm -hmm. and it braids into a million pieces. So sorry, that really stinks. <laughs> yeah, I would just, you know, eat the elephant one bite at a time. That's a popular mm -hmm. saying um, between my partner and I. Um, just one little section at a time, pull up what you can and dispose of it. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Julia asks, can you post a list of drought tolerant plants on your website? I often see, recommend your site's resources, but I don't see anything specific about drought tolerant plants. Um, we can work on that for sure. It's a little difficult because like I showed, um, in, in my slides, um, we have different plants that are better suited for some areas than others. Um, so, but we can work on a drought tolerant specific list. That health strip list is actually um, pretty primo for a lot of drought tolerant plants. So if you go to our resources tab, um, you can see the what to plant uh, lists and go down to health strip garden and there's a long list in there. Um, of drought tolerant and salt tolerant full sun plants. Okay, so we're just about at eight exactly. Um, so thank you all again for coming out. Um, Kristen, thank you so much for your presentation. Really, really informative. Um, and everybody can, again, keep your eye on your email for uh, the recording. It should be out by next week or so. Um, again, feel free to visit the library's calendar to see all of our upcoming events. And thank you again to Progress Norwood and Together Yes for partnering with us on the sustainability series. Um, I hope that everybody has an excellent evening uh, and please take care. Thank you.